Hello, this is Dr. Broussard speaking. I came across this article again recently and this time I wanted to make an educational video for my viewers and listeners out there. So let's take a closer look at this issue. This article is from the American College of Rheumatology's 2011 annual meeting where it was reported on that intensive diet and exercise can slash the amount of pain in older adults with osteoarthritis of the knees and improve function and walking speed. So they had three groups. They had uh, diet only, they had exercise only, and diet and exercise. And it comes as no surprise that the greatest amount of weight loss, percentage weight loss, over the 18 months is going to be in the diet and exercise group. Second of all, for pain reduction. We had the most amount of pain reduction happen in the diet and exercise group also. And if you notice, their pain was reduced about in half as a result of losing weight and exercising. And then finally the improved function. Of course we're going to see the most improvement in the diet and the exercise group almost twice as much as exercise only. But what was important in the diet and exercise group is the increase in walking speed by 12 percent. That was part of the functional improvements that they measured. Now, what's important about improved function? Well, over here in January of 2011, there was a study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association that showed that walking speed and survival were connected. Let's read. Walking speed, an indicator of vitality, may help clinicians predict how long their older patients will live. Oh my goodness, so does that mean the faster you walk, the older you live, or the faster you walk, you'll live older than slower walkers? Let's see what uh, one of the main authors of the study has to say. This is Todd Neal with MedPage Today. Various measures have been proposed to explain the variability in survival among older patients. One that has been evaluated is gait speed. Dr. Stephanie Studensky of the University of Pittsburgh and colleagues performed a meta-analysis of nine studies, including nearly 35,000 people 65 and older, to determine the relationship between walking speed and survival. In every population, no matter how old they were, uh, what sex they were, what kind of health conditions they had, that there was a strong relationship between walking speed and survival. The reason that there's a relationship between walking speed and longevity is because your walking speed is a very simple reflection of how well many of your body systems are doing. Studensky said that knowing the relationship between walking speed and survival may have some use in the clinical setting. This kind of information might be useful and valuable to the healthcare system, to doctors, families, and patients in giving them uh, a sense of um, their own uh, vitality and longevity. Further research needs to be done to determine whether interventions aimed at improving gait speed will result in improved function, health, and life expectancy. For MedPage Today, I'm Todd Neal. Okay, now the article goes on to say that it is also possible that patients will be able to reduce the amount of pain medication they take if they lose weight, noted uh, Dr. Messier, something his group hopes to show with additional analysis. He said, quote, we are hoping from a public health standpoint that medication use goes down, he said, and they expect that it will. Now what do they mean from a public health standpoint that medication use goes down? Let me take you through a brief overview of some of the information that I have on arthritis medications. First of all, let's take a look at what the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality has to say about the use of NSAIDs, that's non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Use of NSAIDs contributes to high costs. Medications do not cure osteoarthritis, but are intended to relieve pain. The agency studies indicate that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs were the medications of choice for osteoarthritis pain until research showed that they affect joint cartilage metabolism. In other words, the drugs uh, destroy the joint cartilage. They have greater risk of toxicity than acetaminophen, can cause upper gastrointestinal bleeding, and may cause or aggravate peptic ulcer. 
In fact, they made a graph to show how much more expenditures that they have in patients that take NSAIDs than non-users and occasional users. If you'll notice, these light green uh, bar graphs over here represent the amount of money that uh, they spend on Medicaid and Medicare patients that are regular users of NSAIDs, regular defined as using NSAIDs at least 75 percent of the time. And in most of the categories they're going to be spending more money on these patients for hospital administrations, prescription medications, and overall medical care. And so let's take a look at some of the other dangers of the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Here's a recent one in th that was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. The title of the study was Aspirin, Non-Steroidal Anti-Inflammatory Drug Use, and the Risk for Crohn's Disease and Ulcerative Colitis. Basically what they found was frequent use of NSAIDs, but not aspirin, seemed to be associated with increased absolute incidence of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Those are diseases of the gastrointestinal tract. Here's one entitled, Study Finds Cardiovascular Risk, Even With Short-Term NSAID Use. The beginning of this article says there is no safe duration for NSAID use in patients with a history of myo myocardial infarction, that's a heart attack. Here's another one that says that the cardiovascular safety risks found for all NSAIDs, not just Aleve, which is naproxen, and Advil, which is ibuprofen, but all of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Here's one entitled NSAIDs, not aspirin, linked with renal cancer, that's cancer of the kidneys. Long-term use of certain analgesics has been linked with an increased risk of kidney cancer. Here's another one entitled All Non-Steroidal Anti-Inflammatory Drugs Have Cardiovascular Risks. Here's one entitled Chronic NSAID Use Doubles Cardiovascular Deaths in the Elderly. Here's one entitled, Even Short-Term NSAID Use, Risky in Cardiac Patients. Here's one entitled, All Non-Steroidal Anti-Inflammatory Drugs Have Cardiovascular Risks. Here's one entitled, Common Pain Relievers Raise Heart Risk, Even for Healthy Folks. More evidence that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are harmful to heart failure patients. Then they talk about naproxen, which is the Aleve. Even at low doses, naproxen, which is Aleve, and these other drugs may increase the risk of upper gastrointestinal complications. 500 milligrams per day dose had a two and a half fold increase in the risk of hospitalization. A 750 milligram per day dose had almost a threefold increased risk. So if you're taking a leave for your relief of arthritis pain, most of the leave is going to come in the 220 milligram uh, capsules and tablets. So that means about oh, between two and three of the Aleve tablets are going to be 500 milligrams per day. That'll give you two and a half fold increased risk of going to the hospital. And then if you take three to four of these tablets, then you're going to increase your risk by threefold. Now, talking about aspirin, a lot of people use aspirin for their osteoarthritis. Here's a recent study uh, out of October 2011. The title, of the, the title of the article was Frequent Aspirin Use Tied to Aging Macular Disorder. Frequent use of aspirin is associated with early aging macular disorder as well as wet late aging macular disorder. And those are disorders of the eye that can cause blindness. Other things that uh, aspirin does is cause brain microbleeds. In this particular study in the archives of neurology, it showed that lobar microbleeds were more prevalent among aspirin users versus non-users or even using some of the other drugs that they compared it to. Here's an article titled, FDA Panel Blocks Stronger Acetaminophen, that's Tylenol, warning labels. And they're wanting stronger warning labels about the drug's potential for liver damage. Because acetaminophen-related liver injury was the leading cause of liver failure over the years 1998 through 2003. Here, this is from the FDA U.S. Food and Drug Administration. 
using acetaminophen and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Too much acetaminophen can destroy your liver. Here's a news story that showed that even small overdoses of Tylenol can add up to deadly damage. Taking even slightly too much Tylenol over a period of several days can lead to an overdose with deadly consequences, this study said. Here's a, an article out of Time magazine. The FDA weighs reduction of painkiller ODs. Tylenol, Excedrin, NyQuil, all of these have acetaminophen in it and can cause severe liver damage. Acetaminophen overdoses send an estimated 56,000 people to the emergency room each year and acetaminophen continues to be the leading cause of liver failure and that was shown in this journal entitled uh, the, the name of this journal is liver transplantation and the four leading implicated drug groups were number one acetaminophen anti-tuberculosis drugs, anti-epileptics, and antibiotics. Now some people use steroids. They go get steroid injections to try to help with their uh, arthritis and their knee arthritis and this one says that steroids are, to are tied to bone death. That's called osteonecrosis. Typically what happens is normally you have a ball and socket joint. This happens to be the hip and there should be a nice wide space uh, between the ball and the socket. And if you get too many injections close together it kills the bone and a lot of people have to have um, uh, hip replacements because of the osteonecrosis. Now when it comes to painkillers, opioid painkillers, uh, they find that uh, opioid painkillers kill an estimated of two people every hour and send 40 more to emergency rooms with life-threatening overdoses. And when you combine them with antidepressants and muscle relaxers, they become a scourge that kills more than 18,000 people a year. Doctors who prescribe painkillers readily are often uninformed about how addictive that they can be as well. In this article from Medscape today entitled Deaths from Prescription Opioids on the Rise, look at this. More than 1,000 deaths occur every month in the United States alone as a result of opioid overdose. Chronic pain affects 116 million Americans and costs the U.S. as much as $635 billion each year. And much of the chronic pain experienced by Americans isn't treated correctly, in part because doctors are not taught in medical school how to help patients manage pain. Let's take a look at the education part of it. This was published in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, the American edition. It was entitled Adequacy of Education in Musculoskeletal Medicine and what they concluded was that 79% 79 per, 79 of the participants failed the basic musculoskeletal exam. This suggests that training in musculoskeletal medicine is inadequate in both medical school and non-orthopedic residency training programs. And This was studied in a journal called Spine and the title of the study was Orthopedists and Family Practitioners Knowledge of Simple Low Back Pain Management and they concluded that both orthopedic surgeons and family physicians knowledge uh, of treating low back pain is deficient. Finally a long time ago in the American Journal of Medicine they concluded they found these statistics there were a hundred and seven thousand patients were hospitalized annually for NSAID drug related gastrointestinal complications and at least sixteen thousand five hundred NSAID related deaths occur each year among arthritis patients alone okay so that's what uh, I mean by this doctor mentioning in the study that we started off looking at by we are hoping from a public health standpoint that medication use goes down. So if you or someone you know is interested in trying to reduce pain medications, lose weight, reduce arthritis pain and improve function, give us a call. This is Dr. Broussard watching your back.